people that want to speak. Uh, there is a screen down here. You'll see your time on that screen. When your time runs out, you'll have a big beep. Please be respectful of the three minutes uh, since we do have so many people speaking. I also suspect that with that many people speaking uh, that there'll be some opposing views on some issues. And I'm going to ask that you remain quiet while other people are speaking, regardless whether you agree with them or not. Uh, quite frankly, they deserve to be heard and they should be heard. And that's what you want when you come to the mic. So I'm asking everybody to please follow that rule. All right, participants must have turned in a request form 15 minutes prior, which we have here to the start of this meeting. Participation is limited to three minutes. Any complaint or charge brought against an employee by name opposition for which resolution has not been sought in accordance with policy should be pursued through the district's grievance policy. Please note the Board of Trustees shall not deliberate, respond, or make decisions regarding subject that is not included in the agenda that has been posted. So with that, we will start, and I will apologize if I mess your name up. I hope I get it close enough that you know uh, who you are and you feel free to, feel free to uh, correct me. That'll be all right. Uh, we go in the order that we received them. Uh, so the very first one is John Webb. Howdy folks, my name is John Webb. I'm one of your neighbors in Montgomery County. On August 2nd, I came and I spoke with y'all about a concern. I'm also a precinct chair for the Republican Party and it's something that occurred on 11 May of this year, a resolution that we started finding uh, inaccurate information on. I, w I felt that it was warranted to come back and speak with you again on this topic. Because as we pulled back the layers of the onion, we found more and more concerning about this resolution and any inaccurate information that was presented in a quorum to us. What this has led to is an in a independent investigation into the facts. The facts on the topic of International Baccalaureate and all the topics within that resolution. Sir, you have a letter of a copy of a letter that was presented to my county chairman. That is for your records to let you know about this uh, investigation. We have an anonymous board on as a panel that is compartmentalized so that we can be able to ensure we have perspectives without collaborative thought and can we also to make sure that we don't have people being attacked. Because we have observed, especially recently, this concept of cancel culture, where folks that have spoke up and opposing, uh, opposing thoughts have been intimidated, bullied, and in some cases threatened. And so what I will tell you is we're going to make sure we protect that, that group, this panel. I am the sole contact for this, and yes, we have a team of lawyers. We have legal review for this. I will be sharing the findings of fact with the county chairman when we are complete, and then I will also share those findings of fact with you. We have in-house topics to take care of, not to share out with this county. Last but not least, I'm going to offer you a resource. There's a pro, and I understand y'all have y'all's own, y'all's own legal team, and you have your own programs for people to report bullying, et cetera. But there is a group called Neighbors Against Bullying for Montgomery County. I will be sharing y'all the details of that information. If you have someone that's on staff, teachers, parents, students, anybody that's being attacked, bullied, especially with this topic as this thing progresses, they can reach out to us and we do have legal counsel for them. So folks, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Webb. All right. Next is Michael Bergen, Jr. Michael Berger, uh, I want to thank you, Honorable School Board. Thank you for your time today. I'll try to keep it quick. 
Uh, my father's here too, so normally I don't do the junior thing, and then my son's also going to speak later. Um, it is with uh, deep respect that I stand before you to kindly request that you grant a dress code exemption for Tristan Berger while we work through a rather lengthy grievance process. It is apparent that there will not be a quick resolution to this matter, and a haircut for my son is little more than just an inconvenience. His hair is clean, well-groomed, and does not impact other students or interfere with his education. He has had long hair for five years, and to remove it now would cause irreparable harm. I am honorably discharged veteran. I have a doctorate in biochemistry, and I'm a lead patent agent at ConocoPhillips. I believe the Magnolia ISD dress code should be updated to include all members of the Magnolia community. I moved to Magnolia over 10 years ago. Magnolia is growing by thousands of residents each year from many different social and economic backgrounds. The current dress code is out of date and not aligned with the current Magnolia population. It infringes on a parent's right to manage their children's appearance and will continue to alienate members of the community. Although it may not alienate all members of the community, it will alienate some of them. And a civil right is a right that belongs to every member. Each member has the right to be themselves and express themselves. It does, the community doesn't get to take away people's civil rights. Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Ben Franklin all had hair that would exceed the current dress code because hairstyles were different in the 1700s. Hairstyles were longer in the 70s, shorter in the 80s, and continue to evolve over time. The current MISD policy implements the shortest style this century and forces many parents to cut their children's hair against their will. Although some children may choose to be in ROTC or other parents may prefer a shorter hairstyle, not all students are cut from the same cloth. I also have a long haircut just like my son does and it hasn't hurt me in the corporate world. Many of the people we hire today have long hair. We request that you allow our son to return to regular classes as the grievance process proceeds. It cannot be the intent of the school board that the student be entirely removed from all education for months or years while we work for a reasonable resolution. If your intent is to force students and parents to cave, that an unreasonable application of law and extremely harmful to anyone seeking relief. Uh, you guys have done a great job. I just can't believe we're wasting our time on this. It's hair. People have a right to have hair. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Berger. All right, next we have Logan Tolar, T-O-L-A-R. Um, hello, I'm Logan Toller, a student at Magnolia West High School. I'm speaking on behalf of myself and other students here at Magnolia West High School who are currently being threatened with administrative punishment for not maintaining what the school determines to be an appropriate boy haircut. Public schools in the state of Texas are expected to foster inclusive learning environments. This necessarily promotes mental health among students, which therefore leads to an increased academic performance. Forcing students to style their hair in a particular way based on an antiquated gender roles means that from an administrative capacity, you are determining my gender for me and therefore how I ought to look. You are my educator. You do not get to make determinations about my gender identity or my sexuality, and therefore you do not tell me how to style my hair. I would also like to mention whatever gender one is assigned at birth is subjective to change, and it would sincerely be in the best interest of this district and as a whole to follow suit with other Houston area districts and completely do away with taking punitive uh, measures in hopes of forcing students to fit into aggressively outdated gender molds. The focus of a school should be on the education of the students and to avoid gender-based discrimi discrimination. The gender and sexuality of a student belongs to the student and their family. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Toller. All right, we have Monica Milliken. Hi everyone, my name is Monica Milliken and my grandson Ashton is a junior at MAG West. He's always AB honor roll. In fact, last year he had straight A's all year long 
and was most outstanding student in two of his classes for the whole year. He's always had long hair. Apparently last week, it became an issue. You know, you've known for a while, and we all know, the dress code, uh, the dress code violates the Title IX federal gender discrimination laws. You have the ability to change it. It needs to be changed now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Milliken. Next we have Helen Erickson. Hello, my name is uh, Helen Erickson and a citizen uh, in this community and also uh, a parent. Um, children grew up in this com com community. I stand here to address my view of uh, against the critical race theory. Critical race theory is an irrelevant, biased, incomplete, non-factor-based brainwash theory. The motivations of a critical theory are creating division, hatred, and discrimination. The discriminations are in color, in skin color, in cultural, in gender, and in geographical region, uh, region of the world. So taking, teaching critical uh, race theory um, in school is absolutely wrong. Um, so teaching uh, critical race theory means to plant evil seeds of hatred, envy, selfishness, and self-serving manipulation and the controlling in children's innocent hearts. In the Bible, Acts 17:26, and God says, it says God has made from one blood every nation of man to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Um, critical race is a, uh, is a, get, teaching the critical race theory gives a legal ground of infiltrating socialism in our community and the families. I came from China in 1988. The civil, the evil and the corrupted the CCP, which is a Chinese Communist Party, has killed more than 100 millions of its own people since 19, 1949 liberation of China. My family was a suppressed and labeled as a shamed and condemned class simply because my grandfather was not in the political correct party and my father was a well-educated engineer. And um, um, let's see. And he was arrested by a group of CCP members for no legitimate reason. Then I was, a depri I was a depri uh, deprived of education right by school committee. So the classmates and teachers lived in horror daily. Of course, the condemned class loses all the social benefits. I don't believe the critical race or race discrimination in Texas or in America at all. I finished my school in America and received my license and serve our community in the medical field. So my children were born here in Texas and grew up in this community without any problem. So as a parent and a citizen, I am against school teaching critical race theory in classroom. It only causes harm and damage to our young children generation emotionally, physically, and uh, um, uh, psychologically. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Erickson. Next we have Danielle Miller. Danielle Miller, and I am the proud mother of a non-binary fifth grade student. Today is day five of Tristan sitting in ISS because of your antiquated, sexist, homophobic dress code. And today is day five of Tristan being disciplined by each and every one of you because of who they identify as. So I just have two things to say. To the teachers across this district who see this discrimination and look away, your silence is heard. Your silence echoes in your classrooms. And to Magnolia ISD, our children deserve to be educated by the rights provided to them as American citizens. Your job is to educate and not genderize our children. So Magnolia ISD, I ask you, 
Tristan asks you, how homophobic are you? Thank you, Ms. Miller. All right, we have Jessica Metz. Good evening. My name is Jessica, and I'm the proud parent of a student at Mag West High School. I'd first like to say thank you to our school board members for doing what you do for our students, including allowing their freedom to choose whether or not to wear a mask at school. With that being said, I would like to ask the school board to please add the district dress code policy to the agenda and address the rights of our male students and their rights to properly groom themselves for the school day. While our dress code might have once been aligned with the standards of society for males, it is no longer the social norm or even standard requirement for many fields and professions. I asked to have the school board, I asked the school board why. Why are we requiring boys to clean shaven daily, have short haircuts, and not allowing earrings when we're not putting limitations or requirements on female grooming? Having some same expectation and standards for the girls. These standards are outdated, antiquated, and discriminatory towards our male population. Over the last two weeks, I've heard story after story after story of young men feeling harassed by the school administrators regarding their hair length, facial hair, and choice of earrings. Seniors have been refused their senior pictures because they don't fit into this box of what the district thinks that a boy in high school should look like. Middle school boys have been threatened to be kicked off the football team because they don't fit into that box. I've heard stories of male students being targeted as early as second grade because of their hair length. These male students have been singled out, emasculated, targeted, and what they feel have been harassed for things that girls are freely able to do to express themselves on a daily basis. Male students have been removed from a healthy learning environment and put in ISS because of the length of their hair and threatened to, remove, threatened to remain there day after day until they comply with the dress code standards. These students are going through emotional turmoil trying to decide whether to stand up for themselves, their classmates, and their freedom, or give and comply with what they can return to class and get an education, which is what we send them to school to do. Again, I'm asking why. Why are we forcing these administrators and teachers, many whom do not agree with these standards, nor do they even comply with the standards themselves, to remove students from normal, calm, productive learning environments, but instead put them in a segregated classroom, teaching them that it is wrong to stand up for themselves for what you believe in, something that is to express yourself in a safe, non-harmful manner. I feel like we do not have our priorities straight as a community if we continue to allow this to continue in our schools. I came across a Houston Chronicle article dating back to 2004 where two students were trying to get the hair length and facial hair addressed at the time, the superintendent said, at any time you look at your handbook and try to determine what the majority of the public wants, administrators and trustees look at those issues and try to make sure that they are basically providing the type of school the community wants. Looking around here this evening, this is not what our community wants. Again, I'm asking you to put this on your agenda to please address in the future because we have children that are sitting in ISS and not learning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Metz. We have uh, Dennis Tibbs. I am Dennis Tibbs, and I'm surprised that the International Baccalaureate Program has not been addressed yet, but that's what I'd like to make a few comments on. And I would uh, reiterate that this is a pretty conservative area that we're in. Most folks here don't want uh, any more government bureaucracy than they have to have and that, that we do have to have, we want to be America first. International baccalaureate, by definition, not America first. And it's not free. If you, uh, if you follow the numbers, there are a lot of socialists and globalists that are making lots of money off of the IB program. The school pays for it, they pay for training, they pay for materials, and if you get government grants, then that comes at the federal level. So it costs all the way around, uh, as I understand it, there are very few students that actually graduate from that program. Uh, it's against most of the things that this area believes in. You probably know that the Republican Party of Texas has a plank against the IB program. I voted for that, and when the issue came up at our county executive committee, it was on the agenda to vote for it, and I also voted for a resolution to oppose international baccalaureate in the county. So uh, I think your constituents would appreciate it 
if you would do away with that extra layer of government, we don't need it, and just get back to teaching, reading, writing, arithmetic, science, and those things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tibbs. Next, we have Brian Harris. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brian Harris. Thank you for your time. Uh, my son is, uh, actually my son and daughter are both students at Bear Branch Junior High, and I'm here to talk to you about the dress code, okay? Uh, I am prior military, so I am very familiar with the ideology that we all want to be conformed, but in this case, I feel like we maybe overstepped our bounds. Uh, my son, personally, uh, was hit by the dress code due to the uh, issue of having long hair. Uh, I know that a number of people have already talked about it, uh, but I took it a step further. Uh, I noticed that in my research, the uh, uh, Texas Association of the School Boards actually recommended this month in August that perhaps we look at addressing that issue uh, of, you know, the potential for our student handbook to be a little bit out of date. Uh, our community, uh, as far as the surrounding communities go in the, in the additional 50 miles of our area, just drew a map, said 50 miles around. Tomball, Montgomery, Conroe, Waller, every student handbook that addresses these issues uh, is far more in line with that policy. Essentially stating that the parent and the student have, you know, have the ability uh, to make that judgment call. Uh, I'm not trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm not trying to uh, allow anarchy to reign. Uh, but I do believe that we as a community can do better. We probably need to update and modernize uh, that handbook to reflect some of the complaints that you're hearing. In the meantime, I'd like for us to put on the agenda uh, or at least take a really hard look at pausing these disciplinary actions while we can discuss how our grievance process works and whether it's really doing what we want it to do in this instance. I know that each instance is separate However, uh, it does seem a bit extreme that you're taking a student who is an honor roll student and you're putting them in in-school suspension. Uh, you're essentially taking some of your, your students that you want to be good leaders and individuals and you're punishing them while they go through the grievance process. And, and that just doesn't seem logical. I mean, I think we can all agree that uh, we all want what's best for these students. Uh, so all I'm asking is that we put on the agenda uh, a review of this policy, a review of the grievance policy, and perhaps a real discussion on why we're not aligned with all the other communities in our area. You know, that, that's really the, the gist of all this, isn't it? We're all here tonight because we're all facing similar issues, uh, but your own governing body, the Texas Association of School Boards, has recommended that you review this. But yet here we are. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Okay. We have Stephanie Burkhead. It has come to my attention that the school district has decided to strictly enforce the grooming policy in the dress code regarding male students' hair length. I am also aware that several students are currently in ISS or being threatened with ISS if they do not conform to the district's gender discriminatory standards. I stand here tonight wearing red to ask that the district stop impeding our children's education. With the pandemic, our kids missed valuable in-person instruction time. We know our kids need to be in classrooms to receive a quality education, so why are they being removed from that instruction because of their hair length? As previously stated, the Texas Association of School Boards earlier this month updated their recommendations regarding dress codes and grooming policies. In it, they recommend collaborating thoughtfully with parents of diverse backgrounds and refrain from including distinctions based on gender and that gender neutral standards may be the best way to promote equity for all students. Moreover, Title IX protects students from gender-based discrimination, and District Policy FFH protects students from harassment for not conforming to stereotypical notions of masculinity or femininity. The dress code and grooming policy is in clear violation of these. 
There are successful adult men here in this audience today who wear their hair longer than is the district's policy. The first year my child's hair was too long, he was an A honor roll student and perfect attendance student, as well as qualifying to be in the elementary's gifted and talented program. It is obvious his hair length has not been holding him back. The district's mission statement says, we're preparing students for a diverse and changing world. The district's demographics have changed in the last 10 years, but our dress code hasn't. In regards to masks, the district has reiterated how they respect the rights of our parents to choose what is best for their children. So why not step up and respect our rights in regards to our children's hair length? I request that the board follows the TSAB's recommendations and work with us towards a more fair dress code so we can live up to being the best district in the state of Texas. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burkhead. Uh, now we have Stanley Burkhead. I'm just going to take a moment. I'm with her. So, um, just for a little perspective, I grew up in this area. I grew up in Conroe. I grew up in Oak Ridge. I started school in the Conroe Independent School District in 1978. The only thing I ever had to worry about from a school dress code is a Spuds McKenzie t-shirt. <laughs> My hair length didn't matter. All they cared about was that I was learning, not on drugs, not getting into fights. Just that I was interested in school. And that worked. I went on with long hair to college, grad school. I've been a professional in the oil and gas industry for the past 17 years, making a decent living for myself and my family. Have I since got my hair cut? Yes. There's also, also some bald spots to prove why I need to get my hair cut. So the point is, I've had my hair cut since before my son made the decision for himself to have long hair. He's not doing it to be like me. He's doing it because he, it's his, it's part of his identity. Since he was born, he's always hated haircuts. Why is that? It's just who he is. So who are we to tell him who he can't be? Who are we to gender him? Who are we to tell him what a boy should look like? It's his right. Kids this past year have had the most stressful year of their lives living through this pandemic, having to do virtual learning, which is a major challenge. So why provide this added stress of saying, well, we know you've just been through all this. We know you've been, we know you've been risking getting sick. We know you've seen family members get sick and some of them possibly pass away. But we're gonna, we're gonna say, we're gonna uh, really penalize you now for having longer hair. We're gonna take you back out of the classroom because you have long hair. It just doesn't make any sense. Like I said, I grew up in this area. I went to m almost my entire school career in this area except for two years where I was in California where people had spiked mohawks out to here and still no one cared. The point is, is that this, this act, this law, uh, this, uh, this rule is a complete and utter dinosaur and that it's really time for it to go away. It's been a dinosaur since the 80s. Most of the people I've worked with in the past have had long hair back in the 60s, back in the 70s, and they went on to have very successful careers. It is really, really time for this to go away. And it just, it disheartens me greatly to see the kids are being put into suspension because of their hair length. We're, we're teaching them to fight for their rights, right? We're teaching them that the rules that are not, that are not proper and not real should be changed. Well, that's what we're doing here. This rule is not right, and it's not proper, and it needs to go away. So thank you for your time. And I'm glad one of us were right. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Uh, <laughs> All right, next we have Mike Berger. Very good. That's Grandpa. Burger. Grandpa. All right. Honorable School Board and Superintendent Dr. Todd Stevens. My name is Michael Berger Sr. I'm Tristan Berger's grandfather and a retired secondary school administrator of 23 years with a master's degree in secondary school administration. I would like to address the issue of my grandson and other Magnolia Independent School District students being subjected to certain dress codes that are neither legal nor conducive to student growth. In 1972, when I was getting my master's, Title IX, which protects students from discrimination based on sex, was implemented. 
one of the tenets of Title IX is that you may not have different rules for boys and girls. I ran my schools, some of them, I had 14,000 students in my last school. I ran those schools with Title IX as one of the guiding forces in, when I made my administrative decisions. Its implementation was covered extensively in my master's courses and we had workshops for administrators on how to implement it properly. Beyond the legal ramifications, I question the validity of hair length being an indicator of anything. I, I checked the uh, wanted felons in the courier on Friday and every one of the male felons had short hair. <laughs> if the hair length standard is for discipline reasons, are an inordinate number of long-haired boys causing behavior problems? Uh, I also wonder why hair length has not been an issue for students for the last two years when our grandson started the high school, but it is this year. My grandson has been placed on in-school suspension, subject to intimidation in the ISS, and forced, forced to drop his AP physics because he was not allowed to attend a required session because of his hair length. This young man who is the 24th ranked student out of 493 students in the junior class, he was honored for his dedication to the band programs in the award assembly last year. Band student of the year, his hair was basically the same length. This arbitrary decision to limit his educational opportunities is unacceptable. The enforcement of hair length guidelines should be examined and changed to reflect the current times. In fact, I checked previous pictures in Magnolia High School yearbooks, and a lot of those students would not be allowed to be in school just last year. So you need to look at this, and as a, uh, I go to church every week, I teach adult Sunday school class, and I work with the youth after, in other words, on Sunday evenings. And I wear a what would Jesus do bracelet. What would Jesus do in this case? Would he judge? Thank you, Mr. Berger. All right, next we have James Nelson. You know, I'm a friend of this school district, but I'm going to break with my remarks today. It is the parents' responsibility to groom their kids. It is not this school district. That's all I'm going to say. However, saying that, this school district has a abundant good points about it. I think it's the best school district in the state. When a five-year-old little boy and a five-year-old little girl starts kindergarten the first day, right up till the school, uh, a young woman and a young man graduate from high school their last day of school and make their mark on the world what makes the difference and makes this school district the good district that it is, is love. This controversy about the hair doesn't fit in with my remarks. It just doesn't. And I have to respectfully disagree with the school district on this. It's the parents' responsibility. It's not anybody sitting up there. It's not any administrator. It's just not. And it goes against all that I've seen, all the love that I've seen for the students as I've started looking into this school district. Those kids out there are loved and they're important, even though it doesn't seem like it in this room today. They are. That's what makes it egregious. When a candidate for a school district goes up to a, a, a girl's place of, import, uh, of employment and assaults her verbally, even though she could stand up for herself, it was criminal. It was the wrong thing to do. It is exactly the same kind of ideas that started World War II. But having said that, I want to say thank you for making the atmosphere that you have done for this school district. Because you have to look hard to find problems in this school district. It's not like up there, in, down there in Houston, where they hit you in the face. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. 
Next is Stasia Norris. Thank you, school board members and Dr. Stevens, for the opportunity to speak this evening. My husband and I moved to Magnolia eight years ago with our homeschooled children. When we made the decision to enroll our children in public school, we knew that we had to form a partnership with you, the administration of the schools, and the teachers. As a former homeschooling mom, I saw firsthand how differently my children learned from each other. And that's why I'm here today, to thank you. Thank you for offering a program for every student. From the child that never studies and makes straight A's, and I have one of those, to the child that works their butt off for a C, and I have one of those, to the child that requires a 504 just to level the playing field, and I have two of those. We are blessed to live in a district that encourages and celebrates the student going straight into the workforce as much as we celebrate the kid going to a four-year university. We have a way for every child to learn. I have three kids at Magnolia West this year. One is on level learning, one is AP learning, and one is dual credit learning. And if my fourth and fifth child came to me and said that they were going to take the IB route, I would celebrate that because I trust the choices that we have made as partners. If this is the path that she chooses, we will support her because she is free and he is free to choose whatever path is right for them. I'm not foolish enough to believe that I will love or agree every decision that you make. My husband's been trying to do that for almost 20 years and it's not happening. But what I do know is that every decision you make will have the love and best interest of our children, our families, and our educators at the heart of it. So I am here today to make a promise to you. I promise when you make a decision that I like, I will thank you. When you make a decision I don't like, I will give you the benefit of the doubt. But I need you to make me a promise. I need you to promise me that you will never be swayed to do what is wrong for our students to appease just a few. I love this district. I love that parents are heard. I love that I belong to a, commun a small community with a big heart. But what I love the most is the peace of mind I have every morning when I give the five most precious pieces of my heart to you. A steward is one who manages the property of affairs of others. I found six characteristics of good stewards, committed to selfless service, believe in sustainability, practice inclusiveness, embrace innovation and change, are good team players, and believe in communication. Ms. McDonald, Ms. Ebel, Ms. Baker, Mr. Adcox, Dr. Stevens, Dr. Moffitt, Mr. Duncan, and Mr. Blizzard, you are great stewards. And my family, we appreciate so much that you are at the helm of our children's education. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Norris. Next is Crystal Wall. I hope I pronounced that right. All right. Good evening. Um, I'll make this quick. I know a main agenda item for tonight's meeting is budget, so I wanted to address the budget. MISD has received over $70 million in federal funding in the last seven years, and you are clearly seeking more federal funding for this school year. MISD is in direct violation of Title IX. For anyone in the room here that may not be familiar with Title IX, it's a federal law passed in 1972 that states that it is illegal to accept federal money and discriminate on any basis. That includes gender, race, religion, etc. Yet the district has and is enforcing a dress code and grooming policy that is littered with gender discrimination as we've heard over and over and over again here tonight. These are facts. We are here tonight to raise awareness and to demand change. MISD is and has been breaking a federal law for years. To the board, we ask that you update your dress code policy and comply with the law. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wall. <laughs> Next we have Stephen Ebel. Good evening, board and Dr. Stevens. I'd like to speak to you about the IB program from a parent's perspective. As the father of two IB diploma graduates, I can tell you that the IB program has done an outstanding job 
of preparing my kids for college. To be sure, the Ivy program is not for everyone. It is rigorous, it is demanding. The number of hours that are required uh, that my children put in to the program far exceed what most college students would put in, certainly exceeds what I put in when I was in high school and college. But their hard work has paid off. They've passed out of several college classes, which will save them thousands of dollars in tuition. They're also taking some of the toughest classes that universities offer, classes like organic chemistry and physics, and they're performing well above their college classmates whose high schools did not offer rigorous programs like IB. Where I come from, hard work is admired and rewarded. The fact that Magnolia offers this opportunity to kids who are willing to commit themselves to high standards should be applauded. Now, about the IB program being part of a you know, Marxist indoctrination conspiracy headed by the UN in order to undermine American values, let me just say from my own experience, uh, like most parents, I'm very involved, or many parents, I'm very involved in my kids' education. I'm very well aware of what goes on in the classroom. As an engineer, I'm lucky enough to still be able to occasionally help them with their homework. And I can tell you if there's any anti-American garbage going on in their classes, I'd know about it and I wouldn't hesitate to take action. In closing, let me say this. Parents must have the final say in how our kids are educated, and no one should be able to deprive my kids of the best education available to them. If there's any inappropriate topics being taught in our schools, whether it's IB, AP, on-level, CTE, any program, trust me when I say that parents are more than capable of addressing this issue whether it's with the teacher or, or, if necessary, with the principal. I would just ask you, let parents decide what is best for their kids. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eagle. All right, next we have Tristan Berger. Good evening, Honorable School Board. My name is Tristan Berger. I'm an, honorable, I'm an honor student at Magnolia High School, member of Mu Alpha Theta, a Star Scout working towards my Eagle Scout, and a percussionist for the Magnolia High School Band and Jazz Band. I participate in UIL and All Regional Band. I've been in MISD since kindergarten. I started growing my hair long in sixth grade and ver feel very proud of it. Members of this community generally accept or even appreciate how long I've grown this hair. I'm asking the board to remove me and others from in-school suspension for the discriminatory hair policy. It's not fair to keep me in ISS while we go through the grievance process. I've already been forced to drop AP Physics because I could not attend mandatory peer meetings after lunch. And after missing a week of meetings, it had reached the point that I could no longer succeed in that course. Any additional time in ISS far exceeds any infraction I may have committed for merely having long hair. I have been in ISS for over a week now and am missing many educational opportunities. It is stifling my development as a musician because I cannot intend in-person training for percussion and jazz band. I comply with all other laws and policies that are just, but the hair policy is discriminatory against um, me for my gender identity. If I'm expected to follow rules, the school should also follow its, its rules. Magnolia High School is a public school, not a private school or military institution. I was under the impression that when faced with an injustice, school administrations or the school board would correct that injustice. The school instead has turned a blind eye to portions of the Magnolia ISD school handbook that prohibit gender discrimination. <clears throat> I respect the policies and procedures put in place by Magnolia ISD. I'm simply requesting that they allow me to access my education while I navigate the grievance process and others as well. I want to excel and represent the school by achieving good grades for the, in the classes I am registered for. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Berger. All right, next we have Daniel Host Hooster. Hooser. How about that? I'll get there. Good evening. My name is Daniel Hoosier. And I am quite frankly appalled with the policies put forth by this school board. You have dehumanized me and demoralized me by forcing me to cut my hair or remain in ISS. You have broken federal law. 
you have gone against the very constitution that this nation is built upon. I mean, it's ridiculous. I give you the utmost respect for all the other policies that are just, but I cannot stand idly by and allow you to further violate me and my classmates' rights. I'm tired of this discrimination based upon sex and gender, and I'm especially tired of how you people are just unapologetic, and it, it, I don't understand. I cannot understand what this rule accomplishes. If you ask any of my teachers or my peers, I doubt any of them would tell you that my hair was a problem or a distraction. I kept it clean and I kept it groomed. And I am tired, I am so tired of the, the garbage I've had to put up with with this school district. I give you all the utmost respect and I, I really expect you to make the right decision. Thank you for your time. I don't need any more. Thank you. All right, next we have Linda Stuckey. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm Linda Stuckey. I've been in Magnolia since 1998. And I just wanted to bring a little bit of perspective to some of the things that are going to be talked about tonight, um, specifically the IB uh, resolution and, and the things that are being waged against Magnolia ISD. Um, I'd like for everybody to just step back from this just a little bit and use a little bit of common sense. Um, it's, it's been so, uh, so much turmoil and so many accusations and so many uh, things going back and forth and on the internet and, and it's just not necessary. I think that if everyone can step back and use some common sense, we can do some research and everybody is capable of arriving at good decisions. I appreciate that y'all are committed to meeting with other people so that you could give more explanation. Uh, I understand that part of the um, uh, Republican Party, the Chairman Christ, and some people from the steering committee and also from the education committee were recently able to meet with y'all. Um, out of that, I think there was five people there, three of them um, all agreed that there was nothing going on in Magnolia ISD that was Marxist or um, harmful to our students. Um, I think that everyone can look online. You know, if here's the thing, if it's on the internet, it's true, right? No, it's not true. Everybody needs to do their own research and not only research the topics, but research the people that are players in the game. I totally commend people for being um, passionate about what goes on with our students. I think there's lots of people that are and there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes I think that maybe, you know, you, you get so emotionally involved in a topic and it becomes your life. And sometimes maybe a little bit too much. And so maybe we just need to step back and take a look at all that. So thank y'all for um, listening to all these concerns. I appreciate y'all and um, uh, just please continue to do what you do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stuckey. All right, next we have Letitia Eggleston. Thank you all for letting me speak before you and thank you for all your hard work that you do for us. Um, my name is Letitia Eggleston. I've lived in Magnolia for 14 years. My daughter was seven and my son was four when we moved here. They are now a third year senior in college and a senior at West. Let's just say we have all been very involved in Magnolia's school system for quite a while. During my daughter's freshman year and sophomore year, she took multiple AP classes. The IB program is only offered to juniors and seniors. So when my daughter was a junior, we found that the IB program fit her schedule the best. It was the second year this program had been offered within Magnolia ISD. It ended up being a very good fit for her. 
She graduated ninth in her class, class with both a high school diploma and an IB diploma. This spring, Hannah will graduate from college in three years because of all the hours she took with her from her high school from West to college. I had her quickly put a few thoughts together so I could have them tonight for the IB program. Please remember these are quickly. Um, in Hannah's words, she says, IB was a program that made me write essays and talk to people. Those two things alone have greatly increased my success, not just at school, but out in the world as well. We didn't just read a textbook and have a teacher repeat the textbook back to us. We learned through conversations and debates. That's a very valuable skill to have today. There's also been a lot of talk around Magnolia School District about the IB pushing a communist mindset on its students. As someone who participated in this program personally, I will say that we talked about communist regimes, but we also talked about capitalism, dictatorships, republics, indigenous tribes, cannibals, democracies, and just about every other way of life you could possibly think of. We, talk, we talked about all these things from a governmental standpoint, an economic standpoint, a theoretical standpoint, and a historical standpoint. We learned. That's what the whole point of school is, isn't it? To learn. One thing I learned about communism is that it doesn't work. That is something that I learned in the International Baccalaureate Program, that communism fails every single time because of human component. Okay, back to me as a parent. At no point in time did we as parents ever feel or learn that our child was being taught anything that was communist, Marxist, or socialist. Please know that if this had happened, my husband and I would have been screaming it from the rooftops. Everyone would have known. Anyone that knows me knows this. Um, as a parent of two very different kids on two very different paths, I appreciate all the options that they are offered. IB is just one option um, that they are allowed, that, um, of tell an, an option of telling what they know. They are able to tell what they know and are given credit for their knowledge. They don't just get it wrong when they miss one fact in the second paragraph on page 26 of the third chapter. They get to tell what they know. Bottom line is this, kids need options because they are all very different. We can't put them in box. Um, while I appreciate everyone's perspective, as a parent, I believe it is my job to make sure I know what my kids are learning. To know the teachers and administration. I encourage anyone that has any problem or concerns to talk to the teachers and the kids and the people that are there teaching it. Thank you, Ms. Eggleston. All right. We have Sofia Lopez. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sofia Lopez, and I am an IB graduate from the 2019 graduating class. I'm so glad I could be here tonight. First, to thank everyone in the school district who brought the IB program to Magnolia ISD, and to all those who helped me earn an IB diploma. My teachers and advisors went above and beyond to make this program a success for me and every other student that has and will go through this program. Second, I wanna share the amazing things I've experienced during and after my two years as an IB candidate. As I was preparing for my junior year of high school, I felt lost. I knew I wanted to take higher level courses, but I never fell in love with AP courses, and IB felt like it was beyond what I was capable of. How wrong I was still surprises me to this day. Learning about this program as a freshman and sophomore, it seemed impossible based on one fact, writing. If you don't know, IB focuses their program around written answers. For someone like me, who was not a strong writer, this was a terrifying prospect. It took my parents putting it into a new perspective for me to see the potential benefits. No, I wasn't a strong writer, but that is why I should take part in the program, to strengthen my skills. In the real world, everything is written. So learning early on would be a tremendous help for me, and help it did. I graduated 17th out of 460 some students with a 3.868 GPA and an IB diploma. I, along with so many others, received incredible scholarships because of everything IB has taught us, upwards of $100,000. Many of my former IB classmates were also able to start college without needing to take basics or core classes. And there are many others who are able to do just the same as Hannah Eggleston, who will be graduating in just three years. I received an $80,000 academic scholarship to Kent State University, a position in the Honors College of Kent State University, and an individual invitation to spend the first semester of my first year of college living and learning abroad in Florence, Italy. I thank, I thank God for the blessings that IB has given me, because nothing would have been able to prepare me for the life in college and the real world like IB did. 
During my time in Florence, I was only one of 13 freshmen who were invited. The remaining 400 some students were either juniors or seniors, and I took classes and befriended many of those upperclassmen. It only took me a few days to realize how much more prepared I was as a freshman than many of my upperclassmen counterparts. It was during this time in a new world, in a new chapter of my life, that I truly recognized the extent to which the International Baccalaureate Program transformed my life for the better. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Next we have Lisa Goodwin. Good evening. Um, I wanted to speak regarding as well as being a parent of a student that completed the IB program um, in 2019. I also have a statement from um, a parent from Rebecca Zachary who is a teacher but also her graduate um, in 2018. I'll go ahead and start with hers as my son is here. Um, when I heard our school was um, going to get a distinction, I was in IB distinction, I was emphatically excited. The thought of having another a way to let students learn is exciting and that my son would be the first IB class. He loved all the different disciplines, being able um, to be taught together in many ways, enjoyed how the writing really sharpened his thought process, and overall how IB appealed to his way of thinking. Global, not just rote memorization. As an active parent, I adored the CAS project and identifying a need that he would be um, able to fill. He chose a project at the elementary school where his siblings attended so he could impact them as well. IB gave him opportunities. Um, ultimately, Noah was awarded a $300,000 scholarship and is fulfilling his dream in graduating in May of 22 with a degree in biomedical engineering and neuroscience and will get his master's in December of um, 2022. He already has a job working with a professor in a lab and a contract experiment from the Department of Defense. He also works as a te um, teacher's aide, working with freshmen in biomedical engineering. He has maintained a 3.7 GPA, all while working. Um, they're excited for their daughter to be able to be, participate in the IB arts program when she gets to the high school as well. I can say that for my son, um, having a, a hearing impairment, severe with 504 plan, and being an IB um, candidate, when he, the things that he grew in collaboration between other students, which you have to do at all universities. You have to do that in the professional world. There's not an executive or any team member that doesn't do that. Learning to communicate clearly in your thoughts clearly, learning how to listen in different perspectives, learning how to debate things from multiple points of view. It doesn't mean that you necessarily agree with those views or adopt them, right? It just means that you're able to be diverse and to understand from that point. That is what IB teaches them. It teaches them about understanding. It teaches them how to communicate their thoughts and make improvements. And, um, you know, he graduated with 42 in his graduating class, cum laude, 100 plus hours of community service. And I could go on, including UIL scholar. So I just want others to have the same opportunities the program that has given us and so many others. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin. Next we have Ethan Goodwin. Good evening. My name is Ethan Govan. I'm an alumni from Nottingham West High School, and I would like to share my thoughts and experience in the International Baccalaureate Program. The IB program is an advanced level education program that spans over two years, consisting of courses in a format that pushes us to grow in our knowledge and learning capacity way beyond uh, your traditional AP course and even compared to your standard college level course. All the courses have a written element that helps us to truly demonstrate what we are learning as students in the form of an IA. These IAs are research papers regarding any topic relevant to any given course, such as history, math, physics, and art. And additionally, we also had to do an extended research paper essay regarding any topic of our choosing spanning across the entire mind, whatever you want to create. Additionally, we were required to participate in a course called Theory of Knowledge, a social study course that was driven through social engagement and interaction. This pushed me and my peers to approach everything we feasibly could with a mindset and to with a mindset to understand everything in a different perspective to see the bigger, bigger picture 
allowing us to have discussions, debates over subject matter regarding current events and, or even some controversial historical events. This was incredibly beneficial to me individually as I have severe hearing impairment which makes communication verbally a struggle uh, at any given point. Ultimately, however, I ended up failing to receive my IB diploma by a single point. I'm not ashamed of this, however. Uh, I was upset at the result, however, but I ultimately looked at the bigger picture, something I learned in IB. I was still graduating top 10% of my class. I was still enrolled into the Colorado School of Mines. And I still had all the skills and knowledge I had acquired with my time in IB. Additionally, I learned something else that I never expected to learn at that point in time. I learned what it felt like to fail without a safety net of sorts and reflect and recover from it because recovering from failure as an adult is a very key skill to have. I do not wish for the IB program to disappear as a result of spreading misinformation from individuals who have not participated within the program. My generation, while still young, is very capable of sharing our benefits that we have experienced from the program and from a global viewpoint and are adequately prepared to provide it to you. While my personal education path has led me to another university and career that I did not initially uh, set out on, the skill sets I have learned within IB have prepared me for it as I was capable of doing the research, uh, risk assessment, and determining my future plans as a result of what I've learned. I was able to attend college, interact, <clears throat> I was able to attend high-level courses, interact, and place finalists in a design competition within my freshman year. At the end of the day, I believe this is one of the greatest opportunities that you have to offer, and I would hate for that option to be removed from any student wishing to take it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodwin. Next, we have John Wirtz. Good evening, board. My name is John Wirtz. I live in Commissioner Riley's Precinct 2. I'm also an officer with Montgomery County Republican Party as his elected treasurer, as well as elected precinct chair in Alder Bridge East. I too voted with the overwhelming majority for the resolution against international baccalaureate on May 11th of this year. If you read the resolution, and I assume you have by now, judging from the pushback from those who have an interest in promoting this UN-sponsored program, you'll see most of the reasons why this could be a clear and present danger to our county and country. From my research, and I'm way too old to have taken this course, um, let me count the ways of Leninist and Marxist leanings IB's intention is to create a particular kind of global citizen. IB supports Agenda 21, now Agenda 2030. IB supports sustainable development, which is active limitation of resources. IB initiative supports peace from the standpoint in the form of disarmament. That concerns me being the son of a German World War II POW. My father-in-law was a Pearl Harbor survivor. My son is an Afghanistan war vet. IB has a, collective, a collectivist view of social justice, supports marked Marxist organization Black Lives Matter. IB pushes for consensus building through civil engagement, Delphi technique of unsuspecting participants. IB is cloaked in utopian feel-good jargon. The UN system is humanitarian, humanist, and nature, secularist. IB's execution is PBBS, planning, programming, budgeting system, superimposed over a representative form of organizational government. It is central planning of all aspects of life. We kind of know that as communism. IB's objective is cradle to grave progressivism. It may not be that way in Magnolia right now, but you really need to keep an eye on it to see if it goes that way. IB's objective, as I said, cradle to grave progressivism, and this is the kicker, the underlying goal, the undermining of Christian religions. What's wrong with the AP program? Like the Conroe ISD board and superintendent who thought CRT wasn't in their school system until a rogue teacher was caught red-handed by a student with a handy recording device 
proving otherwise. You may think the socialist progressive part of IB is not being pushed in Magnolia ISD, but how do you really know? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Works. Next we have Don McMinn. I'm a precinct chair, kindergarten teacher. Just started researching this just, just to see what it was about. You know, lots of controversy in Montgomery County. Um, I remember having a friend who was at Lone Star College about six years ago, having a little trouble with some professors and she was telling me a comment he wrote on her paper that I guess she had written something about um, capitalism being great, I don't know, but he informed her that many people live happily under communist governments. So I thought, hmm, that's a very interesting perspective. And I just kind of put it behind me because I thought, I don't know where he's coming from. And I didn't have a ton of time, maybe spent about five hours so far. Just, I'm a teacher, so teacher training is something I do a lot. And so mostly I just looked at IB website training for different teachers. And um, just in the short time that I looked at that, international student, international mindedness, globalism, those were everywhere in my notes, everywhere. It just in short time. Um, and I could see where a professor could get the attitude that all governments are created equal and that people do live happily under communist governments. Um, I'm not sure if the Uyghurs would be really on board with that and some of the others that have been murdered under those regimes. Anyway, because um, you know, you can make international students, but they need to think that, you know, there's not really a better situation, that, you know, one is the same as the other. You know, if they're they're happy and it's working for them, that's their thing. But there are better ways to do things where people are free free to own their own property, um, something that is getting difficult even in our country, many restrictions. Um, I realize that um, it's our Republican program and that we don't want to be taught by UN and that all your students are not Republicans. But I do think the majority of your community is pretty conservative and pro-American. And I do think that um, the least that has to be done is this has to be researched and the parents have to know honestly what's going on. Um, just the um, CAS program I thought was interesting because every example they gave of the action had to do with climate change. Like there's no other actionable thing. Everything was climate change. That was kind of a, a trigger to me. I'm not gonna beat this buzzer, man. Anyway, those, you know, service, I'm all about that. I've been doing service all my life, um, at school all my life. So I'm all about that. But just some of the trigger words, I think you need to be careful. And I know different teachers can affect it differently, but I do think you need to be careful and the parents need to be. Thank you, Ms. McMahon. All right, next we have Mona Johnston. all. Um, thanks for letting me speak tonight. My name is Mona Johnston and I have been a part of the Magnolia Independent School District for 35 years, if I counted that correctly. So about um, 11 years as a student and then I came back and worked for the district for 24 years and it was uh, some of the best years of my life. So thank you for those years. Um, but I do want to say that uh, during that time I've seen many, many changes in Magnolia as you can imagine. Um, the growth, of course, has just been phenomenal and isn't stopping anytime soon. But in addition to that, there's been lots of growth in the school district and the offerings of courses that have been provided to the students. Those include um, innovative vocational studies and advanced learning and different opportunities and extracurricular activities, and I think our students are the better for all of those offerings. One such offering is the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program. It's available to students at both high schools. My daughter, Kendall, who is here in the audience tonight, just recently graduated Magnolia West with her 
IB diploma, so I'm very proud of that. When she chose to be a part of the diploma program, it was not an easy decision. She thought long and hard before she made her decision, knowing that it would mean a lot more work on her part. She spent countless sleepless nights researching, studying, learning, collaborating, and growing in knowledge, as did the other students and her peers in her peer group in IB courses. She learned to be a critical thinker. She learned the value of understanding where others were coming from, and she learned and had experiences that um, impacted all of our beliefs. She learned the value of hard work and how to prioritize, and I speak for her when I say the extra work and long hours was worth it in the end. I will also say her CAST project that she spent some time on was a food and toy drive for a fellow um, student in her class who um, subsequently passed away from brain cancer. So um, no climate change studies in that situation. Uh, she, she grew um, in many different ways. She actually said that she believes that this was one of the most beneficial experiences she's ever had. Her valuable experiences in IB taught her the importance of putting others before herself and allowed her to grow with empathy and selflessness. I would um, also bring, uh, make, would like to make the point that the Texas legislator thankfully um, allowed this to happen, but she will call, enter college next week as a classified sophomore with having earned over 24 hours of credit. And additionally, I am certain that her success played no small part in the $21,000 in scholarships she was awarded last, last spring. Um, I know that she has been prepared for rigorous college courses, and um, she's been set on a path of success to one day become the forensic psychologist she hopes to be. I want to just say thank you to the Magnolia ISD School Board Administration for the dedication and doing all they can to provide all students a positive education no matter where they come from. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Next we have Alex Garside. My son is in second grade at MES and has always had long hair, which has been part of his identity since he was young. And it's supported throughout society by many of his current day role models. He loves school and is very caring and accepting of all people. Since he started kindergarten, he has been discriminated against for his hair length. Under the outdated district dress code requiring boys to have short hair, and after our 2019 grievance, of the matter was dismissed due to procedure, he was forced to cut his hair to avoid ISS. I had to drag him to the hairdressers in tears, something I'm sure he will never forget. At the, end of the, at the start of the 2021 school year, we were notified that the district would not enforce the hairdress code on my son due to COVID, and he was allowed to wear his hair long, as were many other boys within the district, without causing any disruption to the school or his learning. He was very happy as he was allowed to be himself. Pro progress, or so we thought. Fast forward to today, the district is applying the gender-based policy with a vengeance. And my son was forced to cut eight inches off his hair before school started to avoid ISS, which is no place for a seven-year-old that has already missed so much school due to COVID, let alone any other student that is currently in ISS for the same reasons. He is not alone and many other children in the district who have had long hair for years, which the school has openly allowed are being targeted despite their hair length causing no issues in prior years. You continue to openly discriminate against my son based on gender, despite being made well aware of the violations of Title IX and other laws throughout numerous letters from the ACLU over the past two years. And you choose to spend your time and money on lawyers to defend something that is clearly wrong and is teaching our children that it's okay to discriminate rather than be accepting of one another and forcing my son to question why he should be singled out when a girl with exactly the same hair is not. It is, not, it is my hope that the board will seriously reconsider gender discrimination in the dress code and seek to unify the school district for the greater good of all our children and uphold based on your own code of conduct and ethics that your first and greatest concern must be the educational welfare of all the students attending Magnolia schools, including in this case, boys with long hair. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garside. All right, we have Dale Inman. Good evening, Honorable Board. How are you doing this evening? So good to see all of you. Some of you might know me. I'm a board member in Conroe ISD, so I take umbrage with uh, Mr. Nelson saying this is the best district in Texas. But I do appreciate you very much. I understand the very difficult roles you have on you. Uh, just as a, as a intro, brief intro, 
showing you my heart. I've, I'm a precinct chair. I'm on the steering committee. I was the SD4 chair for the Republican Party here. I've coached 20 years. We've had over 100 children in my home in the last 30 years, in and out, raising them. I do some uh, homeland security work, both domestically and abroad, over in Lebanon, Syria, Iraqi border, and Jordan. And uh, I do see a world from a very big perspective. I pastor a church now. I teach at Lee College, Lone Star College, Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary, with a master's degree in finance and a master's in Hebrew and Greek. And I spend quite a bit of time over in the Syria area of Syria. I, I say all that to say I'm not against at all the IB program, the curriculum that's here today. It's not the curriculum I think that a lot of people are worried about today, but if you bifurcate the curriculum to the, the supply chain that's being built. The, when I was in that meeting that my dear friend, Miss uh, Stuckey had mentioned, I asked the expert that was in Massachusetts, I believe, or Maine, I can't remember now, he was the American US expert. And I said, you're founding, one of the founders of the IB program said, we ask our students to think globally and not nationally. Is that still a position you hold? His answer was yes. We ask our students to think globally. I'm a nationalist, I love America. I'm not for us becoming a one world government. Then I, I asked, would you make a discernment between US or Western democracy and capitalism versus North Korean, for example, I just said North Korean dictatorships, totalitarianism and communism. And the expert said, no, we would not make a judgment call between which one's better. So I'm not saying the curriculum today, I think we should applaud these kids that came up here and spoke also. As they were talking, I was just stunned by the amount of education they have and the goals and the successes they've had with the curriculum. I'm not worried about today's curriculum, I'm worried about if the IB program gets in to Montgomery County, what's the curriculum gonna be in 10 or 15 years? Many of you may know public schools were started so the kids could learn to read the Bible. Where's that today? I noticed that the invocation was almost an apology, and we do it too in Conroe. You know, if you're so inclined, we would respectfully ask that you pray with us. Adults in a school board room can't even pray without having to have some kind of beginning little opening to we apologize. Now, before I go too far, I want to mention, if I had hair like this kid, hair is very important to me, and the older I get, the more important it becomes to me. <laughs> and I would love to have this kid's hair right here, but that's, that's, that's your old decision. I just wanted to mention that. But, uh, I just want to say thank you very much. I'm very honored to have you as members of Montgomery County. God bless you. God bless Magnolia ISD. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Inman. All right, I know I'm going to mess this one up. Kathy Lo Luetta? Losetta. Losetta. Am I close? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I did try. <laughs> Up in the Northeast, they say Lochetta. Lochetta. My husband's 100% Italian. Okay. <laughs> I'm not Italian at all. Uh, so, I have lived in Montgomery County with my family since 1991. My husband and I are authors of two books. We're specialty ministers at our church, and we lead the Faith Votes Ministry that informs, equips, and activates Christian pa patriots in local, state, and national politics. I am also a precinct chair in the Montgomery County Republican Party. I was in attendance the night that my fellow precinct chair, Ginger Russell, brought her resolution to the floor for a vote during our May 11th CEC meeting. All resolutions for that night's meeting were emailed to all precinct chairs ahead of the time for review, contrary to someone's previous comments at a last board meeting. And I voted in favor of Ginger's resolution because I am against IB programs being taught in any school in America. I am in total agreement with the following quote from her resolution. America's constitutional republic is being transformed from within. Our public education system is no longer about providing solid academic course of study based on reading, writing, math, and science. Instead, our federally funded schools are teaching radical environmentalism, radical feminism, critical theory, Marxism, social justice, population control, class struggle, socialism, climate change, hyper-racialism, and more. This curriculum is right out of the United Nations agenda for a one world government. You need to be aware that the UN is anti-American and anti-Christian. Whatever the UN globalists decide to call their agenda, IB, CRT, SEL, whatever, it's all the same. This philosophy began in Frankfurt, Germany in the 1920s and 30s at the Frankfurt School. It was one of the first Western Marxist schools patterned after Marx Engels Institute in Moscow. 
the Frankfurt School scholars fled, fled to Columbia University's Teachers College in New York in 1934 to escape persecution by the Nazis. They purposefully erased the, world mark the word Marxism from their research paper so they would not attract attention in America. These programs are an insidious, and when I say insidious, it's, it's like what Dale was saying. They get in there and they just start growing. And they, it's an attack on Western institutions of our Judeo-Christian foundations. These programs are agenda-driven philosophies and have no place in Texas or American classrooms. In the past uh, Magnolia ISD board meeting, two graduates of the IB program had glowing testimonies of how well the IB program prepared them for college, and we've heard some here today. The IB program does prepare them very well for their next phase of indoctrination. A lot of our colleges right now are, are really socialist Marxist uh, agendas, and I think most of us are very aware of that. And I think all of us... Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. I can't read the first name, but the last... Beverly. last Beverly. Beverly? Mm -hmm. Townsend. I didn't even have my glasses. You just need to feed Christy over here. I'm telling you. It's like I need Braille, I think. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, and I'm here to address the hair code. Um, my son is a senior at Magnolia High School, and many of his friends are in ISS right now for their hair length, or they have been forced to get their hair cut. And um, it's caused a lot of stress. I know it's coming down the pipe for my son because he's not gonna cut his hair, and his hair is a little bit long right now. So um, I personally feel like the community standards have changed, and uh, from what we've heard here tonight, I think that that kind of reflects that. Uh, and that it has changed to meet the community standards around this community. Uh, I think our focus should be more on our education. Um, I've spoken with a couple of people that worked at Magnolia High School and they said that they would rather spend their time, they feel like it would be better spent uh, not policing the hair codes and, as opposed to being able to help the students with their education. Um, I don't feel like there's a reason to punish a student for their physical appearance um, and whenever it comes to their physical body. I think that males and females should be given the same options to pull their hair back if they need to, to keep it out of their face as long as they keep themselves clean. Um, and uh, let's see, I feel that it's a personal choice about a person's own body and it's up to the parents and the students to decide that. Uh, I work for a community college and I've seen a lot of the struggles. I work in enrollment services of the students, the dual credit students that are high school students, new students coming in, and there are a lot more things that need to be addressed, I feel, in our high schools than the hair codes and, you know, trying to enforce how somebody looks. Uh, the, and I guess that's really it. Um, I think if the school stu uh, focuses on the student's education and preparing them to make career and college choices and life choices to be successful, and the student is passionate about pursuing their choice uh, and that the high school has encouraged them in, that they'll make the right decision on their appearance. So, and that's it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Townsend. Next, we have Anita Bowie. Bo. Bo. There's an E off the end. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Anita Bow, and I have had students in Magnolia ISD since 2004 through the present. My daughter graduated in 2017 and is taking her national registry exam this month as her last step in becoming a paramedic. My son graduated from Magnolia High School this past May. He chose to participate in the IV program his junior and senior years. I use the word chose because it is an optional program. The, um, no one is forced to participate. I'm happy to say that he had his first day on a, on a as, sorry, his first day as a lumberjack at Stephen at Boston today. In the IV program, the instructors provided room for healthy conversation and debate. Through particularly trying times of political stress, COVID-19 protocols, uh, gender identity, Black Lives Matter, these type of healthy discussion 
This type of healthy discussion was the opposite of telling our students how and what to think. I think that's important in a free society. Um, not sure if the audience knows that for a student to enroll in the IB program, parental sign-off is required. So are multiple teacher sign-offs. This is a rigorous program that isn't for everyone. I'm thankful my son had the freedom to, cho to choose this program in a world where some students aren't even allowed to go to school. As a parent, never at any time was I unable to see what my son was reading, learning, or writing about. I always had full access and communication with the instructors was encouraged. Never at any time did they teach critical race theory, pro-communism, or Marxism, or any of the other false claims. I invite you, if you have questions, to speak with people who have actual knowledge of this program and how it is being taught in our district, instead of taking the word of fear mongerers who simply want to tear down our district person by person. From the Twitter war in 2014 to the car line at BBES to personal attacks on our school board members through um, the attack on the IV program, our school board is being forced to use time and funds to fight these unnecessary claims and to protect our students. No doubt time that could be spent on the dress code. Um, seems to be a popular topic. Um, I am thankful for our school board who works tirelessly for our students and staff. And to Mr. Inman's point, if the concern of the IB program is just what the future curriculum might include, then let's say that. The propaganda being pushed to our mailboxes says the program should be removed, not just focused on the future curriculum. Thank you, ma'am. All right, next we have uh, Dr. Griffin Smith. Okay, all right. Next we have Mr. Calvin Russell. Hi there. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to say that uh, I respect the opinions of all the people who took IB and they come here and speak glowingly about it. Um, I would just like to say that if there is something implemented that would like to transform uh, the community that we live in, I don't think they would do it out in the open. I don't think that they would use terms that we would readily uh, identify as things that were dangerous. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, I know that you guys uh, recently put out a letter um, about uh, refuting some of the claims about IB that you said that might have been written or seen on the internet and those kind of things. And uh, you enlisted the help of uh, Representative Cecil Bell to go to the SBOE to find out if they would condemn it. Well, I would think that you guys would know that they wouldn't condemn it regardless of what is in it, because that's not what they do any longer. You know, <clears throat> here's the deal. Com uh, compliments of the Republicans in the House and Senate in 2002, standards over content, what a book says about a subject area, were removed by the legislature from the SBOE purview. Now, just because something was approved by the TEA or SBOE does not mean that it's not biased, socialist, opinion taught as fact inaccurate. Approval only means that it has met the teaks, what each child must know at each grade level, which is why any battle over objectionable content now has to be fought solely at the local level in each and every school district in Texas. SBOE has no authority over content per the law, only over whether it meets all the teaks elements. Uh, whoever rules the word rules the world. Liberals seem to know that, but the majority of elected Republicans don't. Whatever a book says, its content is the most important part of the book program. This is why we're losing an entire generation right now. Um, <clears throat> you know, we come before you a lot, and it probably looks like we just don't like y'all. That is not the case. We're only here because we love our country and we love our kids. We don't have any in the district any longer. We did it one time. But we're concerned about the kids that are coming. And I think that if you look at what's coming out of the colleges today, for the great majority of them, they're coming out with a liberal mindset of global-mindedness, global citizens. We have socialists and Marxists 
in our legislature federally. They didn't get that on their own. They got it from where they went to school. So I'm asking you, please take another look at this. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Next we have Ginger Russell. The quote Calvin Cade uh, just gave came from a former SBO E member, I'm friends with quite a few of them. Recently, you may have seen or received, I'm sorry, you sent out a, a letter to uh, the district staff and stuff saying that the, the program is not Marxist, it's not part of the UN, and it's not indoctrinating our students to be global citizens. Is it affiliated with the United Nations? Here is a document from the UNESCO, which is the cultural arm of the United Nations, and IB, International Baccalaureate, is a non-governmental organization of the UN, of UNESCO. Here is the United Nations International School. Their curriculum is anchored in the International Baccalaureate. Does it indoctrinate students to be global citizens? Here is the Magnolia High School International Baccalaureate Handbook for IB. The coordinator says, create worldly and global citizens. Here is a picture of all the IB kids, I'm assuming it's at the beginning of the year. And this student said, IB's idea of a global citizen, and it goes on to tell you what that is. Here are two directors from IB, Ian Hill, and George Walker. Ian Hill says the primary goal of IBO is to the promotion of world citizenship. George Walker wrote a book, Educating the Global Citizen. Is it Marxist? Here is a tweet by the International Baccalaureate Program promoting Black Lives Matter that they stand in solidarity with it. Here's the IBO document promoting social justice and equality, and how we can work towards a more equal distribution of wealth. Here's another IBO document. It includes topics for diversity, inclusion, culturally responsive teaching, social emotional learning. Here's an IB magazine promoting gender neutral schools. Last time I checked, there are two genders in the Bible. Here's a call for disarmament from the IBO, and the IBO sent them to it. The history of IB. John Dewey, he's the father of progressive education. He also co-authored the Humanist Manifesto. Alec Peterson, he's another influencer in the IB program. IB is based on his own deeply humanist liberal beliefs. I think we need to rethink this, guys. This isn't personal at all. Thank you, Ms. Rosa. All right, next we have Stacy Anzig. Before my timer starts, do y'all want to stand up? We're really close. Everybody here is moving around. Do y'all want to take a break? No, all right. We're on 35. Okay. We're getting there. My name is Stacy Anzik. I've been a part of the district uh, for eight years, um, and it's good to see you all again. I was out for a while, so good to be back. Um, can we agree that there is no more place that's America first more than a U.S. naval base? Maybe an Army base would disagree. Maybe the Marines would say, no, a base, our base is more America first. Well, a U.S. naval base in Bahrain is the first time I ever experienced or heard about the IB program because my friend's kids were in it when we were serving uh, there in Bahrain and my husband was working in Saudi Arabia. And so their friends uh, were there and the crown prince's children of Bahrain were there and uh, the ambassador's children were there and the ambassador's children from uh, Britain were there and some other uh, countries and they were debating. They had picked a topic and they were debating and. I was there with my two-year-old, so I wasn't keenly aware of every element of what they were debating, but they were showing the things that they had learned in IB. They were showing how people from different places and different ideas and different 
points of view in the world communicate. And how we get across our America First ideas isn't by barging in and not listening. It's by listening, it's by gleaning and learning from other people. We take what's great about us and we do learn from other people. And I know that people are criticizing and calling that globalism. Well, no, to be a world leader, you have to know what's going on in the world. You can't put your head in the sand. Um, so I think the IB program is great. Uh, I'd love to hear about the students here. Um, the kids that I know in Bahrain, are, they're still Christians. Uh, they were Christians when they went into the IB program. Um, I'm not intimidated by the things that my daughter's exposed to in school because I know that we, what we've taught her at home. And I know that that's where her education began. And I know that the things that we taught can live up to some questioning. She can debate, she debates me all day long. And so she can debate what she believes. And so if we're firm in what we're teaching our children at home, do we think somebody giving them a different perspective or encouraging them to read up on what they believe? The best time I ever de debated or defended my Christian belief was when uh, I had an atheist ask me out. And boy, he was cute. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Anzik, he was cute. But I, cho I chose a Christian man. But I also had to think about what do I really believe? And that's how I was able to defend and became a deeper Christian because I was presented with something I didn't believe. And so I appreciate that y'all have the IB program. I hope Ramsey gets over her fear of reading and writing and dyslexia challenges enough to be in it. That's what I'm gonna propose for my kid. But isn't the best thing about America is that we get to choose, that we have choices, and we get to choose for our kids what's best? Thank you, Ms. Nita Henry. Hello, my name is Nita Henry and I'm a precinct chair as well. I just want to say that I voted for the plank 196 of the Republican Party and I also voted on May 11th for the resolution against Magnolia Independent School District. I believe the seed of liberalism needs to be removed. I believe that the parents need to know what's in the program and I don't appreciate our taxes being used for this as well. I'm also gonna now finish Kathy's uh, speech. Kathy was, um, says, I think most of us can agree that young people today have a radically different view of America than their parents or grandparents. Why is that? Could it be the education they are receiving at our government-controlled schools? Magnolia ISD school board meetings are not unique. There are school board meetings all over America, filled to standing room only with parents who are finally waking up and paying attention to what their children are learning at their expense. American school boards must throw out this globalist, Marxist, anti-American indoctrination immediately. This school board and boards across our nation must reject these programs to save our great country for generations to come. If not, I expect more and more parents will opt out of government-run schools in favor of homeschooling. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henry. All right, next we have Jake Gabriel. Okay, so he had to leave. All right, so. Brian Christ. Members of the board, thank you for your service. My name is Brian Christ. I am an IT consultant by day. In my off hours, I serve as the chair of the Republican Party here in Montgomery County. I am also a taxpayer here in Magnolia ISD and a homeschool parent. I come to this conversation about IB from a unique perspective. My mother was an educator who retired out of the Texas education system after about 30 years of service. But me and my wife made the decision that we wanted to homeschool our children. I understand this debate over the IB program and 
what it is and what it isn't. And it's all actually relatively new to me because I didn't know about it until a few weeks ago. I took the time to go off to the website and I got to tell you it did. It raised a few eyebrows. But I also know that there's more to the story than first meets the eye. And so I took the time to investigate. What I wanted to know was what was going on here in Magnolia. Were our kids being taught things that were markedly unpatriotic, markedly against capitalism and our Judeo-Christian values? As I started to sift through it, what I actually found from testimonial after testimonial from my conversations with folks who have administered the program is that while the parent organization does look quite questionable, they have never once driven that down to the local level. Over the decades, what they have actually fostered is a bottom-up development of the curriculum. In other words, I, what I heard and saw was that Magnolia ISD was supporting the very opposite of what I was alarmed about. Kids were coming out of the program learning about the merits of capitalism against other forms of economic policy. They were learning about Judeo-Christian principles, reading things like the screw tape letters. So what I'm here today to do is to encourage you. Think about the program. I, I will agree with you know, my colleague in the party that Keep an eye on this. While well, today it's not, it could be. I also know half of y'all or more personally, so I assure you that if I thought something was going on that was horrible, you'd hear from me. Um, but today I don't, see any, I don't see any cause for alarm immediately, so I would say if you decide to remove the program, don't do it because the accusations that are running around right now that it's Marxist or anti-capitalist or not Judeo-Christian. Do it for other reasons but not for that. And lastly, I'll say this as I close, the strongest, most masculine person that I've ever known is found in the book of Judges. Thank you very much. All right. So, yeah, that was, that's it. If everybody was wondering when the last one was, I, yeah, get a round of applause for that. I'm going to go off schedule because I know a bunch of people probably want to leave. Uh, so we are going to take a short break so that anybody that wants to leave can leave. Uh, or if you need a bio break, you can have that too. Uh, you're welcome to stay. We're going to be talking about the budget next. So thanks a lot. List of items to be routine and will be enacted by one motion unless separate discussion is requested. I need a motion that we approve consent agenda 5A through I. Before we approve that, Chuck, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Um, the out of district transfer student list was huge. Yep. Yeah. And that's a testament to the fact that we've got a lot of people that want to be in this district. Yep. I think it's fantastic. Uh, the resolution increasing the local leave for COVID-19 related absences. I personally speak with a lot of districts around the Dallas area and they don't do anything like this. I mean, what we're doing is, and we've done it before, but what we're doing again is taking care of our teachers in ways that a lot of districts just don't do. So I wanted anybody that's around to hear that that hadn't read that stuff because it's good stuff. Thank you. <laughs> kind of cleared out a little bit. So, <laughs> so it was motioned by Christy, seconded by Kelly. All in favor? Motion passes. All right, considered agenda, Dr. Morris. I... So Chris, we killed the batteries on the mic? That's bad. Chris, do, do I need to go ahead and, and read the that next part? So be the public? Okay. So at this time, we'll be going into a public hearing regarding the 20, 2020. Oh. Okay. I thought she said just go Still ahead. Still nothing. Is it working? No, it's not. But he's, he's working. Here we go. Oh, there you go. You had to turn it on. Just had, had to hold it right. <laughs> yeah, where'd everybody go? All right. So thank you, Mr. Adcox, members of the board. Um, before we go into public hearing tonight uh, to discuss the 21 22 tax rate and budget, I uh, wanted to give a presentation, you know, quickly to. 
show some of the changes that we're going through for the 21-22 school year. Uh, a lot of it uh, you will have already seen at least one, so I'll go through it fairly quickly. But uh, can you all hear me okay up there? No? Okay. Uh, but please let me know if you have any questions, okay? Um, obviously, we'll um, go through the, the three primary funds that require board approval in the general fund in terms of the day-to-day -day operations of the school district, the debt service fund for interest in sinking purposes, um, as well as the food service fund, and then we'll talk about tax rates. But um, before we get to some of the numbers in the general fund, which is where we'll spend most of the time this evening, uh, I wanted to go over uh, and show just a couple of different views of how we compare uh, to average districts and some peer districts in terms of our revenue uh, received, as well as our expenses, and also some staffing views that uh, uh, you might not have seen in, in some time. So, first off, on, on this slide right here, you'll see a breakdown. <clears throat> excuse me, of our general fund revenue uh, by object code as it compares to the average district in the state of Texas. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see the percentage, and um, I don't think this will come as a surprise to you, but um, obviously this is a compounded effect uh, of um, uh, HB3 and, and so many other bills throughout the last decade and two, two decade or two. Um, but primarily can be focused on our wealth per student as it relates to property value. So what it means on the left-hand side is that the average district in the state of Texas receives right at 50% um, of their general fund revenue from local sources, primarily driven from property taxes. Uh, and you can see that we are higher uh, than that at 58% almost, uh, which again is, is driven by our property value per student. Uh, to counter that, uh, we receive less state aid than the average district in the state of Texas uh, from 48% to 39%, okay? Now, probably the most interesting thing on this page, if you look to the right, um, after HB3, uh, and we know that there were winners and losers there, and even with uh, HB 1525 uh, that was recently passed, you'll see that the average district in the state of Texas uh, receives about $800 more per student uh, than we do as a district. And so uh, what does that look like? That's almost uh, $11 million uh, when you multiply times our number of students. So I think that's important to keep in mind uh, when you look at, um, uh, you know, what the amount of money that we have to use uh, versus other districts and, and then how we choose to spend that. Any questions on that? Okay. And then here's a view. Uh, with some of our peer districts in terms of how we spend our dollars based on an accounting object approach. Um, uh, generally speaking, you'll see no surprises here. We know that the average district in the state of Texas spends well over 80% of their budget on payroll and employee benefits, which is the blue uh, section. And you can see that we uh, spend right at 85% of our budget on payroll and employee benefits. So. Um, which is one of the reasons when, why when uh, there's uh, reductions handed down by the state uh, in some of the years past, it's difficult uh, to not affect uh, payroll. Anyhow, you'll see that most of the districts are comparable there. Usually the larger the district, you'll, you'll see a slight increase in percentage uh, makeup for payroll and employee benefits. Any question on that? Okay. <clears throat> Next, I wanted to show just a, a quick view of uh, staffing ratio, student to total staff ratio. Um, obviously, the board knows that uh, we've grown uh, student enrollment wise uh, throughout the year, but throughout the years. Uh, but I think um, I think this looks good from a frugality uh, perspective. Uh, when you look at it, and, and you go back ten years, uh, and in 2011. Um, uh, for, for we had one staff member for every 7.3 students. And so while, you know, our student enrollment uh, has grown and we continue to add staff to respond to that, you'll see 10 years later, uh, we're still at 7.7. .7. Uh, so we've been pretty consistent with that. And I think that that uh, obviously looks good from a frugality uh, perspective. Any questions on that? And then here's, a, here's another view. Uh, this is uh, uh, compared to some of our peers in terms of student to teacher ratio. I think um, 
I think that this looks good as well from a from an academic perspective and uh, from a financial perspective. You see that uh, we we have one teacher uh, for every 15.15 students. You don't want to be that point wife point one five student, <laughs> but uh, uh, just over 15 uh, students. Uh, you know, for every one teacher. And again, uh, we're basically in line with our peers uh, with Montgomery ISD and New Caney and. I'm going to hope that Huntsville, uh, it was uh, simply a timing issue for PEAM's uh, purposes, and they were able to, <laughs> to correct some of <laughs> that. that. But, right. um, uh, but again, I, I think, you know, I don't know that we look at this a lot uh, as, as a school board and administration, so, so I thought that uh, it would be meaningful for you, for you all to see that. And again, uh, from each from an instructional perspective um, in terms of student to staff, number of students in our classes, um, and also from a frugality uh, perspective, I think it's a good balance. Questions on that? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. This next slide shows a historical revenue versus expense uh, back to 2009. I know that Ms. Ebel uh, in our last budget workshop asked uh, how many years in a row we had had a, a balanced budget. And so uh, here you go. Here's a clean view. <laughs> uh, also, as it relates to our fund balance growth, which, which is pretty much kept pace, um, obviously, without escrowing taxpayer dollars. So. Um, so again, we've we've had balanced budgets uh, each year uh, since going back to before 2009. Okay, any questions on that? All right. So now we start getting into some of the numbers, and again, most of this is old hat, and I know the board is, has heard this from me uh, multiple times. But you know, we've we've attempted to build a two-year budget, and we're utilizing 2021 fund balance uh, contribution. Uh, that is made uh, in large part um, available due to some of our federal stimulus dollars. Um, we want to minimize our recurring costs and allow anticipated student enrollment growth to catch up, if you will. Um, we talked about this in the last meeting from a revenue perspective. Um, as our property values grow, uh, our tax rate is compressed. Um, and for whatever small amount that we're able to increase in local revenue, the state decreases accordingly. So, as we've talked about before, <clears throat> excuse me, the only mechanism uh, to increase uh, revenue is by increased students. Now, there is the tax ratification election that's still out there that's not 100% um, aligned to benefit us at this time, but it might in the future. In particular, if you go back and look at, at how much we receive per student versus the average district in the state of Texas. Um, so as the primary driver of additional revenue, we were very conservative uh, with our enrollment projections. We projected a 250 student increase. Um, if you see in the, uh, just below those bullets, uh, you can see that um, a recent uh, synopsis uh, shows that we're up right at 450 students already uh, in current year uh, for funding purposes. Now, and, it, and as you look back to the 2012-13 school year, you'll see that um, you know, that enrollment normally grows from the beginning of the year to, to snapshot, which is taken at the, at the end of October. Um, but even as of today, or within the last few days, uh, we've already exceeded uh, the, the heaviest growth uh, since 2012-13, um, which, which obviously uh, looks good for budget purposes. Now, you know, the enrollment obviously drives everything, but for, for funding purposes, it's based on attendance. And so we know uh, that, that in a normal setting, this would equate uh, to, to being far ahead uh, for funding purposes, but we're very cautious uh, given the, the COVID requirements and 10 days at home and so forth. And so, but it is a good position to be in at this time, only a couple of weeks into the school year. Okay. And obviously, uh, what that allows us to do is that committed fund balance, it just, it just chips away, if you will, at that amount, which um, prepares us better for the subsequent years. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. On the expenditure side of things, you know, we um, shifted the one-time bonus, or excuse me, one-time retention payments uh, uh, from the general fund uh, over to the federal stimulus money uh, because it's a perfect utilization of those funds. Um, and, and in doing so, we're, we're also proposing a raise of 2%. Uh, within the general fund, we gave a $1,000 retention payment in August, and we anticipate doing the same in, in November. 
Um, and with those ESSER dollars, we, we have built into the budget for the next two years uh, additional two, two additional $1,000 uh, retention payments each of those years. Okay? <clears throat> Excuse me, this is a view that I showed you guys, uh, the board, uh, in last budget workshop, but uh, this is a, a synopsis from the TEA state aid template which shows uh, how the funding uh, works, if you will. Again, I mentioned property value increases, tax rate compresses, you generate slightly more local revenue, and your state aid is offset accordingly. So student to student from one year to the next with no change, this, this is the, the end product. Um, we're again at the top of the page, you'll see 2020-21, uh, uh, and towards the bottom, 21-22, you'll notice that the gross m and revenue from local taxes increases about $900,000, um, and uh, the state aid decreases accordingly. So the amount of money that you have to use is exactly the same. Okay, any questions on that? We have questions, but not for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I may have worn y'all out at the last budget workshop. No questions. Okay, so um, pulling all, all that information together, guys, with, with a, obviously a relatively simple uh, revenue projection. You know, we're projecting an increase of about 250 students. We're already ahead of that pace. We've committed uh, some fund balance that we're contributing in 2021 to be able to remain conservative uh, with our enrollment projections. And ultimately, we have balanced budgets uh, within the three primary funds, 121.7 million, 121 .7 million in the general fund, uh, 5.9 million in child nutrition, and uh, 25.9 million in debt service. Okay, any questions on that? <clears throat> Let's just shift gears and, and talk some about our aggressive bond defeasance plan. Um, and our debt service, and then we'll, we'll talk about property taxes. But um, I showed this slide at the last budget workshop. Again, just as a reminder, uh, what we've done, accomplished uh, the board's direction uh, the last handful of years, taking advantage of bond refunding opportunities and market conditions. We've saved over 30 million in the last three years. And at the bottom of the page, you can see as we compare to ourselves uh, 10 years ago, that we've taken that debt per student Bonded indebtedness, voter approved, from 13,600 to 10,459. Okay, questions on that? Oh, wait. Okay, okay. Just want to make sure, because I think you said it, it was voter approved debt. Voter, voter approved, yes, ma'am. Because and, and I know some, of, some folks don't understand I know, I know the that debts. Our board understands, yeah. but, but, you know, the word debt has a negative connotation, but ultimately, uh, these, these are for building facilities that are inevitable, that, that there's really no other approach that a district has, reasonably speaking. It's like a mortgage. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's the way it works. But yes, ma'am, bonded indebtedness approved by the voters. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And here's another comparison uh, at the top of the page in terms of voter debt uh, per student, voter approved debt per student. Um, as it compares to some of our peers, and I showed the top one at the last budget workshop, uh, you'll see that we're at 10,500 uh, per student, uh, which again, against the, the, our peers that are listed here, uh, based on ge geography, uh, as well as enrollment and so forth, that we're in as, in as good a position as any uh, for, to prepare for the growth that, that's coming. Um, a new view uh, towards the bottom of the page, and tried to highlight this, but it didn't come out uh, apparently. Uh, this is a, a little bit different view. Th this shows our bonded indebtedness, the principal on our outstanding bonded indebtedness as it compares to um, our assessed property value, okay? You'll see Magnolia ISD, it's second to the bottom. Uh, the average um, is, I can see that. The average is 4.84, and you can see that we are just over two and a half. So again, just a different view. I mean, we, we talk about debt uh, on a per student basis, and, and we look very good there. Uh, we talk about it as a total numbers. We, we look solid as well there. And then as it relates to your property value, which, which has a, a lot of value uh, in, in that comparison, uh, we, we look good as well. 
Okay, any questions on that? <clears throat> so let's shift gears and talk some about tax rates. <clears throat> so obviously the m and side of things, it's relatively easy, it's calculated for us. Uh, tax rate compression kicks in based on our property value growth. So we are proposing a decrease in the M&O rate of 5.77 pennies tonight in regular session. Um, INS side, we believe we can meet our bonded indebtedness requirements and also pay some debt off early with a three cent decrease for a total uh, decrease in the, in the tax rate of almost nine cents um, to go from $1.27 to $1.18, okay? The other big thing, and I know we talked about this at the last budget workshop, to the right of the page, <clears throat> given that the percentage uh, decrease in, in the tax rate went down more than the average taxable value went up, the average taxable home uh, will pay roughly $59 less, if you will, for the entire year in taxes. Make sense? Okay. So that's a good position to be in. Property tax rate history. You can see that we were uh, peaked out in the 0506 school year at $1.79. Uh, we had the same tax rate for four years in a row prior to two years ago. We dropped it from $1.38 to $1.31 to $1.27 and proposing $1.18 tonight. Okay. So how, does, how do we compare to our peers uh, for overall tax rate? This is a, a new... Uh, view that, that we pulled. Um, well, you can see towards the right of the screen, we, we're the red. And so as you look at Houston area tax rates, um, I, you know, obviously we're in a pretty, pretty darn good position uh, from that perspective. We're at $1.18, uh, which is half a penny uh, higher than Conroe um, and exactly one penny higher than Willis uh, to be in, in the top four uh, in the Houston area for, for the lowest tax rate. Questions on that? And at this point, that uh, concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions from the board and when the board is ready to open for public hearing. Does anybody have any questions before we open? I just got one simple question. Uh, the raises for the teachers, uh, the 2% plus the bonuses, when will that be formally communicated. I mean, I know we're adopting this thing, but when is that normally formally communicated? I know we've already spoken yeah, about it, right? Chuck kind of let us put that out at convocation. Yeah, at convocation, we talked right. about it a little bit. But we will, we will re-emphasize it with the passage of the budget and salary structure. Yes, sir, with the adoption tonight, it kicks in the ability for us to communicate that officially uh, okay. tomorrow. Yes, sir. Well, that's what I wondered, because some of us might have got an email that said, sure. shame on you for not... Uh, giving the teachers raises, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, I we thought that was raises. communicated. So anyway, that's the reason for asking. And one of the bonuses, I mean, that, that's already out there. They, it was in there. It's, it's already been paid. There. August 15th was $1,000 for all employees, so, except the superintendent. I think there were one or two of them that we left out. I'm not sure. There were <laughs> Eric, I do have a question because um, in the past there's been <clears> – <throat> Some folks that continue to say that this board is actually a paid board. Is there one penny in that budget to pay us? No, sir. There Thank is you. not. There never has been and there never will be. <laughs> Thank you. That was hard. That was so hard. I appreciate but, that. But I do love you. I care for Man. you dearly. Wow. Okay, then. Well, you're you're so, not the only one who loves us tonight. I, I, I'm very glad that's clear now. <laughs> so, so just to clarify, I am paid nothing for this position. Yes, ma'am. You were elected official and, and you're paid uh, zero. Zero. For this position. All right. And there's Which no pay increase for me this year. No, ma'am. It's zero. And no bonus. Zero, zero times whatever is zero. Yes. And we didn't get a bonus. No bonus. Okay. No, sir. No, sir. All right. Well, thank you. Because I've had people tell me that I'm paid. I'm very happy to clarify that. I just want to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so happy about that. That's but, it, Chuck. I quit. Yeah. Hey, Eric, I got a question. I know, everybody was yes, under sir. the false impression, right? <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so anybody else, any, anything else? I, I got a quick one. We heard a lot tonight about federal funding, and I saw the number there. But can you give us the percentage that we are funded by the federal government and what that money goes towards mainly? Well, 
I think I know the answer, but I want to hear you, know, you say it. I, I would say, you know, when you remove the one-time stimulus money, uh, Travis, it's, it's, it's less than $10 million is what we receive a total or, or approximately $10 million. Uh, much of that is our uh, reimbursement for, for breakfast, for National School Breakfast and, and Lunch programs. And then the vast majority of the other is, is specifically for, uh, for specific intent. Uh, Title I uh, money we receive to, to focus on our at-risk students. Um, and then there's IB, Idea B money that's intended to, sp to be spent on our special ed students. But those are the three primary uh, federal funds that we receive. And then there's some very, very small amounts that we receive for, for other items. But Less than 5% maybe? Oh, yes, clearly. Yes, yes, yeah. less than 5% for sure. Yes, sir. And, and, then and, and in the general fund, it's less than 2% that we receive, and that's all for student health and related services for Medicaid reimbursements. So it's a very small, very, very small part, but it is very important. I mean, in particular for our at-risk students and, and, um, and for our special ed <coughs> students as well. Well, that was the one other thing I was going to say was the special education funding that I'm proud of, and I, I wanted you to go over that and I, kind of give us a kind of a real quick synopsis of what we spend on special yeah, ed. Yes, sir, and, and I, I know I included that view in the, in the workshop, and I didn't have it on there tonight, but... Um, and looking up the data, the average district in the state of Texas spends 12% of their general fund budget on special ed cost, and uh, we spend over 15% of our general fund budget on special ed services. So. Anybody else? All right, now I, get, now I get to read this. I don't even need my glasses. You printed it big enough, thank you. <clears throat> At this time, we'll be going into a public hearing regarding the 2021-2022 proposed budget. We shall now open the mic for public hearing portion of the meeting for anyone who has comments regarding Dr. Morse's presentation. First of all, I want to assure Mr. Blizzard, I'm not going to ask any questions tonight. I just have a couple of thoughts that I wanted to share with the board. Uh, I've been attending these meetings for four or five years, uh, too long perhaps, but uh, that means I've seen the budget presentations over and over and over again. And uh, I think Dr. Morris does an outstanding job of stretching the dollars that you get. Uh, and it's unfortunate that the state of Texas limits the dollars that you get the way it, I've, I've lived in a bunch of other states and I've never seen uh, state aid handled quite like this. But anyway, my specific comments are regarding faculty salaries. 2% raise is not enough, folks. I expect more than that of my Social Security. It may not be as much in dollars, but I don't get as much in Social Security as teachers get. Uh, but seriously, uh, every time teachers' salaries are uh, discussed in this board meeting, it's always, well, we're competitive with nearby districts. The heck, several of you are in business. Do you want to be merely competitive, or do you want to be ahead of the competition? Now. I don't know where the money is going to come from. I don't know whether there's any reallocations in future years that could be made. But if I were a young college graduate coming out of Sam Houston, yay, where I taught, uh, going into education, and I looked at that salary scale and saw what I could make in 20 years, forget about it. I'm going somewhere else. I'm the son and grandson of public school educators. My grandfather started out at a teacher's college, and uh, apparently he was a pretty good teacher. Within a few years, he was superintendent. Then he made the fatal mistake of getting married and starting a family, <laughs> <laughs> and finding that he could not support his family the way he wanted to on a superintendent's salary. So he went to law school and had a very successful career as, as uh, a lawyer. Uh, but there's a lesson there, and somehow Texas hasn't learned it. I don't know what uh, you folks can do to try to uh, uh, make up for it, but I'd like to see the salary scale for MISD uh, 
a little ahead of the competition. So you can cherry pick the best people from the nearby districts and say, hey, come over here, you can make a few thousand dollars more. In addition to the working conditions, which I understand is one of the attractions uh, for uh, recruiting teachers from outside the district. Uh, well, that's my piece. Thanks for hearing it. I'll get out of your hair. <laughs> Thanks, Hugh. So, is there any, <clears throat> any other comments? Okay, if there are no other comments, then we will conclude this hearing. The time is 8.55. <clears throat> Consider and approve adoption of the 2021-2022 proposed budget. Dr. Morris. Thank you, sir. As presented in the uh, presentation earlier tonight, we are recommending approval of three, the three primary budgets of general fund, child nutrition, and debt service fund, 121,679,592 in the general fund, 5,870,889 in child nutrition, and 25,876,860 in the debt service fund. All right, I need a motion that the board approve and to adopt the proposed 2021-22 budgets in the amount of $153,427,341 with a general operating fund of $121,679,592, debt service fund of $25,876,860, and a food service fund of $5,870,889. Motion by Gary, seconded by Joe. All in favor? Motion passes. <laughs> Was that a I, I'm from with you. Jackson? Well done. <laughs> All right, consider and approve adoption of the 2021-2022 proposed tax rate for maintenance and operations. Dr. Morris. Yes, sir. Um, as I mentioned in the presentation earlier, we're proposing a M&O rate of 87.77 cents, uh, which is a 5.7 cent decrease. Um, I do wanna mention briefly just on the language here, um, like I mentioned earlier, the, the average home is paying less than the total tax rate, $59. We talked about that earlier, <clears throat> which means that we avoid some of the language that we've had to have in the past for the no new revenue or effective tax rate for the total tax rate purposes, right? Uh, but it doesn't mean that we can preclude the same language for M&O, no, no new revenue rate purposes, okay? So just quickly, because uh, it's very confusing, uh, Mr. Atcox will, in a minute, read a motion that says this tax rate will raise more taxes for maintenance and operations than last year's rate, which is a fact. The tax rate will effectively be raised by 0.35% and will decrease taxes for maintenance and operations on a $100,000 home by approximately $57.20. So I just want to break that down quickly. There's two different calculations going on in this one statement, okay? Uh, the first part of it is for the old effective tax rate or no new revenue rate, M&O, okay, which is a fact that it's increasing by a mere 0.35%, and again, we know the state is decreasing that as well. So, but the second part of that is on a $100,000 home. So from year to year, we're decreasing the tax rate, they're paying less for M&O, okay? And just to be sure everybody understands, the M&O side, is strictly for maintenance and operations. Yes, you can use that. You could use it to pay off debt if you needed to. Absolutely. But INS can only be used for the voter approved debt. 100%, yes sir. Okay. Anybody else? All right. <clears throat> and I'm gonna have to read that. You're exactly right. I need a motion that the board adopt the 2021 ad valorem tax rate for maintenance and operations of 0.8777 per $100 valuation. This tax rate will raise more taxes for maintenance and operations than last year's rate. The tax rate will effectively be raised by 0.35% and will decrease taxes for maintenance and operations on a $100,000 home by approximately $57.20. I need a motion. Motion by Christie, seconded by Kelly. All in favor? 
Motion passes. All right. Consider and approve adoption of the 2021-2022 proposed tax rate for debt services. This one's much simpler. We're decreasing the tax <laughs> rate by, by three pennies and obviously uh, taking advantage of the property value growth uh, to continue to pay off our debt and, and pay off some of that early as well. So we're proposing a debt service tax rate of 0 0.3095 per $100 valuation. All right. Any questions? Everybody? All right. I need a motion that the board adopt the 2021 ad valorem tax rate for debt service of 0 0.3095 per $100 evaluation. Motion by Travis, seconded by Joe. All in favor? Motion passes. You're still up. Yes, sir. Con consider and approve into year 2021-2020. 20, 2021 through a curve. Uh, budget amendments, Dr. Morris. At least the back's holding up this year. Yeah. I don't remember. Uh, that takes us back. Yeah. So, um, yes, yes, sir. Uh, we have not had a budget amendment presented to the board this year, uh, but we have had a few anomalies, obviously, uh, in plant maintenance and operations, as well as facilities and acquisition. We had some um, insurance claims uh, that we've yet to, to adjust the budget for, and so, Ultimately, at the end of the day, we're, we're simply cleaning up at the end of the fiscal year on the expenditure side, but uh, the end effect is zero to the bottom line. We're shifting across functions, okay? Um, now, we are increasing the, the debt service expenditure side of things by 350000 The board recalls we project very conservatively, and then when it was time to do the refunding and early defeasance, we saw that we were going to have more revenue than what we projected, so we decided to... Uh, to, to go for more uh, of a payoff, if you will. So ultimately, we're simply cleaning that fund up at the end of the fiscal year as well. So again, the bottom line for the general fund is no effect. We're moving across function, and on the debt service side, we're increasing the expenditure side by 350000 I uh, will tell you that the revenue still uh, outpaces the, the expense on the debt service. Anybody got any questions? Oh, all right. I need a motion that the board approve the 2020-2021 end of year budget amendments for the general fund for the physical year ending August 31, 2021. Motion by Joe, seconded by uh, Gary. All in favor? Motion passes. I think, is that it for you? All right. I appreciate it. Oh, this is a real fun one. So everybody keep your, get ready to put your hands up, okay? Consider and approve a delegate and alternate to the TASB Delegate Assembly. So it's time to appoint a delegate and alternate uh, to the TAS, TASB uh, convention scheduled to be held Saturday, September 25th. I think it actually starts on that Friday, if I'm not mistaken, on the 24th. Uh, last year's delegate was Kelly McDonald, I served as an alternate. Thank goodness she uh, came through for us. Uh, only one person has to attend the meeting. It is in person as we set today, but everybody knows right now everything's kind of subject to change. Um, however, if both the delegate and the, it's in Dallas, if both the delegate and alternate want to attend, they are welcome to. Uh, our board's participation in the delegate assembly ensures our voice is heard. Do I have a volunteer for a delegate? Come on, Travis. All right. <laughs> Dr. Moffitt volunteers uh, to be the delegate. How about an alternate? Gary. All right. Gary Blizzard will be our alternate for that. Uh, so I need a, a motion that the board uh, select uh, Travis, Dr. Travis Moffitt as our delegate and Gary Blizzard as the alternate to serve on the 2020 TASB, or it'd be 2021, that's wrong. 20, I see you led me wrong on that, Chris. I actually do read this stuff. Um, to serve on the 2021 TASB Delegate Assembly. I'm sure somebody will wanna make that motion. <laughs> Sonia makes the motion, seconded by Christy. All in favor? All right, motion passes. Uh, Thanks, guys. Uh, and yeah, yeah, there we go. That is actually the, the last thing on the agenda. Has anybody got anything else that we need to cover? Chuck, I'd like to uh, say something if I could. Okay. Um, 
I th thanks for the uh, chance to, to speak. Um, I, I know a lot of people don't know this about me, but my, uh, my grandfather uh, only had an eighth grade education because he had to, uh, he had to leave school uh, because his, uh, his father had died and he had four siblings that he had to start earning money helping uh, his mom. So uh, since then, uh, future generations in my family, um, I've been able to go to college uh, and as uh, Ben knows, go back to college at the moment uh, with you. And I've uh, been able to serve on a school board, uh, be an advocate for public education. It's a big deal uh, in our family. And as uh, also a lot of you know, uh, my kids uh, have long been gone from the district. Uh, five years now uh, they've been gone. Uh, I've still enjoyed every second of, of uh, serving on the school board. But I do believe that there are other parents uh, that should have that right to serve. And so uh, what I'd like to do, and, and it's important that it's, uh, it's parents that have kids in the school that, uh, who, like me, only have the best interest uh, of the kids and all the teachers in mind. Um, and they should have an opportunity to serve. So with that, um, I, I told uh, Mr. Adcox today that I was uh, offering my resignation in the hopes uh, that, that we will find a parent um, that will step up and want to serve, because I think everybody uh, deserves a right to serve. And uh, of course, I will stay here until uh, you find a replacement and be here for everything, because I will always support the schools. I just think it, it would be a great opportunity for uh, somebody to have the same opportunity that my family's had. So, thank you. Well, I, I'm going to go on record and say um, you'll be missed. It's been uh, fun having, because we are a, a bunch of people from different walks of life. And I, I'll argue that that's what makes us a great board. And so, appreciate all your service. Thank you. I would add a couple of comments. Uh, number one, uh, Kelly, you have served with, for, for not only just for all the right reasons, but with such a passion and a heart for it, uh, and you were all in. And, and not everybody serves in that way, and so I just appreciate that. I think uh, you were fully dedicated to what we're all about uh, for all the right reasons, and, and we couldn't say thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you. You're going to try to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Well, I also just want to thank you because... We've shared a screen for years now. <laughs> and glasses. <laughs> and glasses and pens and kick each other on the table if we need to do something. But I uh, really appreciate it. And I'm going to be sad not to share a screen with you. Well, you'll see me a lot. But I, I just think it's uh, everybody should have the right to serve at some time. And I've enjoyed every second, y'all. Thank you. And that's it. All right, so at this time, the board will now recess to move into closed executive session for the purposes permitted by pursuant to Texas Government Code 551.071, consultation with attorney, pursuant to Texas Government Code 551.072, discussion and purchase of uh, purchase, sale, exchange of value of property, uh, pursuant to Texas Government Code 551.074, personnel discussion slash recommendations. I really appreciate all of our administrators staying with us in that. It's a long night, but I appreciate you guys being here. It's good to see you back there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you all. Yay. Yay for y'all. <laughs> and now you may go home. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I need a motion that we adjourn this meeting. Motion by Gary, seconded by Joe. All in favor? We are done, and it is... 1121. You know, it is the title, not.